Today, the focus in this room is all about mobile. Um, it's kind of a perfect storm going on in mobile right now um, with the adoption of the iPhone, with the, uh, with the explosion of tablet ownership. Um, one of these days, I would hope that Android might get their act together, and that'll be awesome. Um, APIs that allow you to do in-game uh, or in-app purchases, and, uh, and so the, the rise of freemium uh, monetization models in mobile, a lot going on in mobile, um, and uh, it's a really exciting space. So I thought we'd kick off mobile this morning with uh, Vilya Hayari, VP of Brand Management for a little company called Rovio. They made this game, you may have heard of it, I don't know, has anybody in here played this? In any case, um, the title of the presentation is Where's the Weirdest Place You've Played Angry Birds? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, and let's kick off the day. Thank you. Uh, nice, to, nice to see so many of, of you here at this early hour. Uh, the party last night was great, and it probably explains why this, this room looks like a label from Plants vs. Zombies right now. So, anyway, uh, what's the weirdest place you played Angry Birds in? Uh, this is something we asked, asked our fans uh, on, our, on our Facebook uh, fan community. And um, it really occurred to us from the thousands of replies that we got that people really do play the game in the weirdest of places. So, we're, uh, uh, back, when, back when we were starting development, uh, we found it, uh, Rovio was founded in 2003. Uh, there really weren't like a there weren't any rules in mobile, mobile game development. So we were looking at just the mobile context and what can we do in mobile gaming. So in 2003, uh, the market was very different. We were looking at the audience as, as, as the core gaming audience. So people who play video games now have mobile devices. They have a platform where, where they can play games on the go. So for a long time, a number of years, Rovio was developing like hardcore titles, um, survival horror, racing games, shooters, so on. So core ga co hardcore games for the core gaming audience on mobile devices. And as we all know, uh, the platforms, uh, there wasn't like a unified platform. Uh, it wasn't like really refined at all. So what you had was, was Java development for uh, 150, 200 different mobile phones, and basically you were like porting games like hell. You were you were testing uh, testing your titles on on dozens and dozens of devices, and what was more of a challenge, you didn't have a pipeline, you didn't have any connection to the end customer, so you were reliant on device manufacturers, operators when distributing your games. Uh, even the customers had hard time finding your games, like you were advertising them all over the place. Uh, putting a lot of money in advertising, but people still had like no clear way of where to find like the latest mobile games. Will they work on my device? How will I buy them? How will I purchase them? So uh, we had a good run in the Java development though. Rovio was like uh, started by three guys back in 2003 and ended up with about 60 employees around the peak time in uh, in. Uh, 2000, 2006, 2007. But after that, the, the market was dwindling. There wasn't a lot of profit in, in developing those, those uh, Java games. And of course, uh, people were like, uh, they were like, uh, the limits of the, of the new mobile platforms were obvious and the flaws. So the, the core gaming approach was the wrong one at the time. So we were starting to think like, how do we, what, what do we do in the mobile? And we turn into casual games. Uh, of course, that kind of like change in the whole mindset and the, and the development philosophy doesn't happen overnight. So there was a lot of trouble and uh, the company went to around 12 people uh, in 2008, uh, 2009. And uh, in 2009, uh, iPhone had been out for two years. So it was uh, one unified marketplace, one device, one, one platform. End-to-end uh, -end, uh, like service for for uh, publishing your putting your game out there and reaching the consumer. So we decided to create one strong casual casual game and focus on the characters, focus on the brand, try to make it successful. 
And it really it took uh, eight months to develop Angry Birds. Uh, it cost about 100,000 euros. Uh, usually at the time, uh, for a typical Rovio project, uh, the budget and, and, uh, and uh, time was about half of that. So, so maybe four, four months and around uh, 40,000, 50,000 euros. So it was a big undertaking for us. But we were really, really like wanted to wanted to take it through because from early on, like from the first concept sketches, we had the birds there, and uh, even though the first game concepts were very different from what Angry Birds is today, uh, everybody at the studio was looking at the character sketches. Like, what are these guys? We really want to do something around these. So it started to evolve around the characters, and um, we really polished the game so that uh, the end product was was fun to play was engaging actually why it took so long to develop was that um, for at the for a number of times when the when the game was being tested the guys at the studio were actually spending like days and days just playing the game because they were having too much fun with it so uh now that we the game is out there we're aiming for the maximum reach so that is that is also that's part of our our brand strategy and not just a, not just the game and marketing strategy. So you may may have heard like Peter Westerbach uh, from Rovio previously like like painting a bold picture of of reaching like one billion people. But what does it then like mean to have have like an audience of one billion people? I mean, you can have have different types of reach. You can have a massive reach of people who have heard of your game, heard of your brand, heard of your product, and are discussing about it. Then you have the tier where people are actually spending money on your products. Uh, then you have maybe the more important part of the people, so the people who are engaged with your product that are actually spending time with it and and ha have have. Uh, your product has their full attention and engagement. And then, of course, you have the core, core fans, the people who love your title, love your brand, love your characters, love your game. These are the people who will recommend your game and preach about it to other people, like how awesome it is. And that's, that's like where the biggest brand value is. So, of course, we want to see one billion people here at the core. That's not going to happen, <laughs> happen probably anytime soon. But, but the more, more we can move people from the outer tiers to, of the reach towards the core of being, becoming a fan, that's, that's our challenge and our biggest mission. So we're here, we're of course like the topic of the day is mobile. But what do you do? Like how do you reach the people in the mobile? We have taken, taken, um, taken uh, the strategy of branching out and going everywhere, going on every, every screen, not just mobile. Uh, that we're big in mobile, we have the opportunity of, um, of uh, reaching, reaching bigger audiences on all screens and, and with different products and on different markets. So that will also give us a bigger reach and bring, bring back people to the mobile channel. So, for example, we, uh, when, the, when, the, when the game was selling well in uh, 2010, we were, we were taking a uh, planning, planning to bring on merchandise and uh, plush toys, T-shirts, all kinds of products. Now we recently had our first uh, print publication out, an Angry Birds cookbook, and uh, and uh, are planning also more on that side. So that will also like come back to the digital in the form of form of e-books and apps and so on. So uh, then then we're also planning uh, uh, planning on creating uh, animation. So that will be like short form animation, animated series, uh, possibly a movie sometime further down the road. And then of course like in-app purchases, like we have the Mighty Eagle in the game. We want to create like, like, um, like new experiences there, uh, new monetization. And then for example, Google Chrome, uh, we have had the game out for free for our fans on Google Chrome for six months now. So. No monetization, just driving traffic to our, our merchandise store with some conversion, but basically getting a massive reach on markets where people don't have smartphones, where people don't spend, spend money or, or don't have an app store or, or can't even get the game, get the mobile game. They have the game available on, um, of, on uh, Google Chrome through pr browser for free. So that's like tens of millions of, of new users on, on new markets entirely. And uh, regarding, oh, let me take you back there for a second. And then I forgot about the promotion. So 
uh, we had a big promotion with Angry Birds Rio uh, collaboration with 20th Century Fox. So that was something where uh, where we we had a had a joint promotion, created the co-created the game with 20th Century Fox, their Rio movie property and our Angry Birds property, and uh, we sort of had access to their movie promotion uh, machine and uh, budgets and. They had a lot of publicity for the upcoming movie through our game. So, uh, and then with Nokia, for example, we've been doing these uh, Angry Birds Championships uh, competitions where people actually sign up to play Angry Birds head to head and they have like, uh, they have qualifiers and then semi-finals and finals and a big tournament and they win prizes and devices and so on. So, uh, both of these stem from like the, like the two, two classic things that you want to foster as a, as a company and as a developer. Uh, one is networking. Never, never be afraid to like network outside your, your business and your comfort zone. Like network with people from the film industry and from entertainment wherever because that will bring big opportunities down the line. And second is like with Nokia, we have been working with from the beginning of the, when the company was work first, first uh, founded. Uh, we've been working with Nokia uh, on a number of projects. So, so uh, that now that we our brand is big, we have the opportunity to do even bigger promotions with them. So always foster your long-term partnerships. And on on other promotions, uh, this is a video of uh, of a promotion we did with uh, T-Mobile in Barcelona. So T-Mobile wanted to do a campaign around Angry Birds. They had had a number of these uh, viral videos out. Uh, and they actually actually built like a seven meter tall, about 30 meter wide uh, Angry Birds set, uh, where these big birds were were fired from a pneumatic cannon, and um, it was it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun to like like watch everything everything like everything come together, uh, and this this is like. Um, uh, this was this campaign was planned by uh, by Satsi and Satsi, uh, T-Mobile's ad agency in Europe, and uh, everything executed by them. And and this was again like a like a big partnership opportunity for us because we wouldn't we wouldn't it would have been very difficult for us to like justify like pulling pulling massive resources to put something like this together. But then again, like working with a big operator and their uh, distribution channels and their their production budgets. This was this was possible, and uh, I, I think that it's been it's been watched like well I I can't remember how many millions of times, but I I believe it's like the seventh uh, most watched like viral video on the internet uh, or, or in the TV commercial category. So it's it was quite successful, and and this is this is like the kind of engagement that we want to be doing with our partners that will people will share like crazy and it will it will like live a life of its own and to date we've had uh, a little bit over 400 million downloads of the game and 300 million minutes of angry birds is is played daily uh, globally so uh, of course like that's, that 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 number of downloads it's a, it's very simple but it's it's and it's a bit arbitrary because you have all the free uh, free downloads there you have ad ad uh, funded uh, android downloads uh, then you have paid downloads so of course it doesn't tell anything about the revenue and how how successful it is but it's a it's a pretty good indicator of the reach and uh, and of course in, in when it comes to engagement 300 million minutes is, is pretty good and why do we then need this engagement and why do we need the massive audience uh, this was from uh, streaming color uh, developer from North America, and um, uh, they did a survey where they uh, interviewed, or they put out a questionnaire for mobile developers uh, and iOS developers especially. And uh, I think uh, over 200 developers replied. Many of them just one guy and and his uh, part-time part-time business, but also like uh, like premium studios, and. Uh, the, rip, uh, what, uh, the, the landscape on iOS hasn't really changed, uh, so it's like the top 10% of, of titles are making significant revenue over their lifetime. So you can see from the graph that, uh, that the median, median uh, uh, total lifetime revenue of mobile games in App Store is around $3,000. Of course, this isn't, this isn't like 
uh, uh, the 100% factual truth. This is just from one survey. But uh, the, the thing is that it's becoming more and more competitive in the, in the iOS App Store uh, all the time. For example, uh, last year this time I remember reading a statistic that uh, uh, from all paid applications in, in the App Store, the median, median revenue was around $15,000. So if we're looking at games and we're looking at $3,000 over, over a game's lifetime, you, you know that you just have to, be, have to be close to the top. And it doesn't mean that you have to be on the top globally, at least initially. Like when Angry Birds was released, we were, we were pushing for, to make it number one in Finland. Of course, that's a, that's a tiny market, but you want to be number one in Finland, you want to be seen at least locally on the charts, because then you can take it, take it further. You will know that you can be number one somewhere else as well. And of course, like, how, do you, how do you keep people engaged with the application? And, and how, do you, how do you keep it going? Uh, these are all the updates that have been provided for Angry Birds uh, during its lifetime. So we don't consider these software updates as such. It's, we're, we're providing a service to our fans. So we're bringing more levels, more content, uh, more visual themes, more characters. Like we try to keep the game fresh. Uh, and even if you can like cynically just look at that, oh, okay, they just brought more levels. But we bring a lot of details, we polish the gameplay, we bring a lot of new elements to the game all the time. And we do this across all of our apps, uh, Angry Birds, Angry Birds Seasons, Angry Birds Rio. And what's more, we, we're aiming for new markets. So trying to identify new key markets and uh, what to do there is of course um, a big thing when, when you're get, trying to get more reach. So for example, we brought the uh, Moon Festival update uh, for Angry Birds Seasons. And, and for Angry Birds Seasons, we try to bring like these new themes, uh, new episodes based on different, different like festive seasons and, and festivals around the world. So Moon Festival might be relevant to, to a lot of people, but very big in China, very important. And, and people, people know it and it's, people are familiar with it. So we had a pretty good reception with that in China. And that's actually right now our, our uh, like biggest growth market and fastest growing, growing uh, uh, geo geographical uh, market. And uh, the, with Moon Festival, with all of our products, we're also trying to bring like more content. So all these animations, uh, all, these, all, the, all the stuff that we're creating like in all of our channels, it's, uh, we see it as, as creating added value to the customer. So we're expanding the storyline uh, behind Angry Birds a bit by bit. So in the game, you, you just see like the characters, but you don't, you don't really know anything like where are they from, who are they, what are they like. Um, you see that the, the pigs have stolen the eggs and they're angry, but, but besides that, like what are their hopes, what are their dreams, like who are these characters? So that's, that's what we have planned in our animation side and, and our book publishing and all the storytelling that we will like keep a more richer, uh, more engaging world. And uh, we provided this um, moon, moon Festival comic also in China. It was distributed uh, digitally in uh, China Daily and, uh, and uh, via uh, like MMS subscribers in, uh, uh, on, who had uh, 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 CMCC mobile plans. And then we also, also experimented briefly like, uh, like delivering the comic through our game, uh, through the iPad version of our game. So you go to the pause screen and you just see the comic there and you can, you can read like daily episodes. And the reception was pretty good. It's, it gets a lot of views, uh, a lot of, lot of nice feedback. Of course, something like this isn't for everybody, but then you get like feedback like, uh, my kids wake me up at 5 a.m. to just daddy, daddy, let's go, let's go check out the latest comic, uh, Angry Birds comic. So a lot of, lot of positive feedback as well. And uh, we just accidentally happened to host it in our online store too. So we try to try to like steer some monetization as well. And of course, new characters. That's a, that's a big thing. Mighty Eagle, uh, our first in-app purchase, uh, introduced also uh, about a year ago. Uh, with Mighty Eagle, uh, it's not a, like a cheat in the game. So you get this, when you buy Mighty Eagle, you get this option to use uh, this can of sardines, which you then fire, fire into the levels, and then that, that uh, 
that's a, acts as a bait to, for the mighty eagle who comes and smashes everything to bits. But it's not only that. It's not like, oh, I'm stuck in the game, I need mighty eagle to help me. It's that. But then also there's new gameplay elements, there's new goals, new achievements that if you like play through every level with Mighty Eagle, then you get, you unlock more stuff. And of course, um, uh, other characters, it's, it's a very big thing for us to, to bring new birds because we have like a set of established characters. So we're bringing this orange guy into the game tomorrow. New bird. Anyway, that's the, that's the, we, we see a lot of these opportunities uh, in all of the branches that I introduced previously. So it's, it's, a, it's about getting the reach, uh, but also, also like providing a better service. And if we see like, an, we're, de we're, we're not any more mobile developers. We see ourselves as an entertainment and media company. So uh, if we see like an opportunity to experiment with print publications and, and drive a strategy there and get more reach, maybe get some revenue, then we go for it. And uh, if it doesn't work, then we can try something else. But that's, that's not like, um, well, I'm not saying like that every developer has the, has the opportunity to go into book publishing or, or uh, go into merchandising or, or make a movie out of a game. But if you if you're not only like creating just creating apps, but you're also focusing on building the brand and the characters, then you ha may have the opportunity to go into licensing or, or or go into pushing these these sides of the business as well. Okay, so what what is the weirdest place you played Angry Birds in? Anybody? While listening to me talk. <laughs> I'll, I'll forgive you. It's it's not it's not a sin to to play. It. Anyway, uh, we got like literally thousands of replies to this question on Facebook, and and um, some of them some of them pretty basic, like you know, on the go, waiting for the bus, uh, during lunch hour, lunch break, something like that. Some of them uh, a bit more weird, and some of them like like uh, a bit disturbing, like at a funeral. So. <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, it's it's a bit disturbing and sad. But then again, like if we can bring like a moment of joy in a time of tragedy, then that's why not. Okay, but uh, we we try to do do uh, a lot of lot of things on on Facebook and on Twitter online to encourage people to to share and create around Angry Birds. So a lot of these like fan-made videos. Uh, all kinds of art. It's it's just it's it's something that has like created Angry Birds into the sort of phenomena that it is today. So I guess that it's it's it has something to do with the game itself. That when it's physics based, when it's so easy, you can you can like experiment different things and you can try like try and see like what happens if I do this and if I do that. So then then you can like really like you you get these ideas of well, I'll just build like a like a full blown. Angry Birds set somewhere, and um, <laughs> and actually, like this video, uh, this this fan video happened uh, before that uh, that T-Mobile promotion. So so sometimes the fans are fans are much faster than than what what you can do in marketing anyway. And and we also get like uh, receive like dozens of pictures of cakes. So, so people bake these uh, Angry Birds themed cakes and cupcakes and, and uh, for their children uh, for their own birthdays and have like whole Angry Birds themed birthday parties and, and whatnot. And uh, again, we don't like go and sue them. We don't say like uh, cease and desist and stop baking immediately. But it's like, like something like this when you just go and share it. Uh, I mean, people will bake anyway. So you just go and share it, and people, it's, it's something that's so delightful and simple, and it give, gives, like, you get a lot of positive feedback from sharing stuff like this. And, and here's actually, this is like the most bizarre thing, I guess, what I've seen is like, this guy made a playable Angry Birds cake for his, uh, his son's birthday. So I guess that his, uh, his uh, six-year-old son was a, was a big fan of the game, so, um, and a big fan of cakes probably as well. So, so um, uh, I, uh, like I, I can't imagine like the where where do these people get like this level of creativity, 
where they where they actually actually come up with the idea that okay, I see Angry Birds, I see people creating games like like live action games, I see people baking games. I'll just create a playable cake. So I I think that we we might be when we're in in if we're just focusing on mobile, I think that we're our focus is 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 pretty much wrong. So we should also focus on cakes. The cake is not the lie. In cake purchases, how does that work? Yeah, uh, well, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. I, I guess it will involve pigs anyway. Okay, but yeah, that's also that's that's like a random fan video, 6.7 million views on on uh, YouTube. So. It's it's really organic. People just love to share it, and we also like encourage people to share. And uh, if somebody posts, uh, creates something really cool around Angry Birds. Uh, they're not like damaging our brand. They're not they're not uh, uh, making making uh, any sort of like illegal business around it. Well, well, what's not to love? They're just like expressing their love towards the brand. And we also get a lot of fan art. Uh, uh, this is not fan art. This was drawn by me. No, I'm I'm just kidding. But people send us like these pictures, and and by the way, we don't condone illegal graffiti in any way. But this is super awesome. So, <laughs> don't you think it's awesome? Anyway, uh, we we see like all of this stuff happening all around the world. So, what can we do? It is, and we're not gonna sell like Angry Birds branded branded spray paints or anything, but. Again, like you, you can share it, and you can just let your fans know, like like all kinds of cool stuff is happening around Angry Birds. And uh, I, sometimes I feel like this fan art is, is it's better than what our studio pumps out. But you know, that's that's like you you just have to sh show the developers their place one day. And we also we give back, try to give back to the community. So this is a this is a picture that the five-year-old guy called Ethan. Uh, send us or Ethan's mom actually. That uh, Ethan drew this level that could you could you incorporate in the game? So um, our developers were uh, were feeling perhaps they had like extra time or something, but they they tweaked it around a bit and put it in put the level in the game. And they even included like Ethan's original signature uh, as an Easter egg. So if you go high up to the sky, you can see it there. So. We can't like uh, we get uh, quite a number of number of these suggestions like put this in the game and put that in the game and of course we can't like put everything everything there but sometimes we try to give a, give a little back and uh, uh, this is just the usual pitch for Facebook and Twitter but these are like the main and easiest channels for maintaining a healthy dialogue with your fans so of course like. Uh, uh, in some markets, you don't have have this even available, or you don't have access, so you have to do things a bit differently. But it's so easy to to activate people when if you can can like make people aware that you know just integrate your your like buttons and stuff in your apps, and you can make people aware that okay that that you have some channels open for them, and they'll come to your your and ask you questions and uh, and um, ask ask for help and support and uh, and post and share, share cool stuff. And with tools like uh, uh, there's like several community management tools where you can easily like manage the discussion, and you can you can keep 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 um, uh, keep the discussion going and keep keep people sharing sharing all the things further and further. Uh, I think that there's a, there's quite a many like new t new new apps, and especially if you're talking about if your studio is like one or two guys and and you publish a game, it would be so easy to like share like behind the scenes insight and, and what made you develop this game and, and what's the next stuff you're coming up with and and you know it's it's uh, these are like some of the most simplest channels that you can do that sort of discussion through and uh, we try to also also uh, get get access to new markets and, and new reach through these channels so in china you don't you don't have access to facebook but but you have like weibo and and local alternatives so we do like regional activities on new markets to try to establish a new fan base there as well and uh, it's so far it's working really well 
uh, we have 8.7 million uh, page likes on Facebook and that's without having the game available on Facebook so that's just a fan page where we're sharing like fun content and and some artwork and some added value and and of course news about the game and updates and What's significant is like Facebook recently uh, implemented this talking about this metric. So for, for over 400,000 people are talking about it and that number is roughly similar to what, what, uh, what the like fan pages of, well first of all Facebook itself and for example Texas Hold'em Poker have. Uh, there's, there's more than 400,000 people talking about those two but they have like plus 50 million page likes each. So you're looking at like the activity ratio. How many, how many followers or page likes you have? How many people are talking about? Like what's your, what's your actual reach and activity there? And our activity is still, still pretty high and, and that's, that's where we aim for, trying to keep the, keep the dialogue going on outside the game as well. So how do we then, uh, if, we, if we have the fans in the game, if we try to take them in our communities, we try to reach new markets, new audiences. How do we then like go go like beyond that to to create something 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 that will like get a global reach? I think our collaboration with with 20th Century Fox was like a like a good testimonial of of um, how the, how the like, dynamic is shifting shifting the mobile. So. Big brands, uh, big companies uh, from different industries are looking at their mobile strategy and going for successful brands in the mobile and trying to leverage them into getting like their new products out there. So with us, like we also have an entertainment brand. So we're at the, like the perfect crossing of this. If you look at like film industry as the traditional media and the mobile is now the, now the latest new, new focus. Uh, we can provide like this uh, half a minute uh, engagement every day, but then if we go and collaborate with the film industry, we can join in on like that massive promotion, like which has like that huge engagement. Uh, when you release a new feature film, you're going to market it with a hundred million dollar budget, and then you're going to have like this one huge event where when the film is released and people are queuing up, up to the box office, and that's where all the focus is. But with the mobile games, any casual games, you're going to have, want to have like a long-term engagement where people are buzzing about it all the time. So, of course, it doesn't have to be, uh, it's like an old, old, really old like marketing analogy that, that if you're looking at the film release and a big ad campaign, that's the fireworks. That's like a boom and sparkles but, and huge budgets and it's quickly over. But then like the social media activities, that's more of the campfire where people are. It's much more low key, but people stay around it for a long time. They come back to it, and they then then they can they can stay at your campfire, and then from time to time they can observe the fireworks. So it's it's um, it's um, it's 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 good to good to aim for huge promotions and like these collaborations outside just uh, just your own domain. And uh, for us, it's also like putting, putting a, taking a foothold from that entertainment domain. So taking like what is seen as a just, just the mobile game and collaborating with the film industry. Al also like positions us there that okay, that we're in that, like that same level where we can actually like seriously start talking about creating animated series or around the characters or, or creating a movie. And uh, with, the, with the print publication, it's the same thing, that uh, we're taking the story, story deeper, uh, creating, creating more, more meat around the bones. And uh, that's, that's a form of content where a lot of, lot of thing is, things are happening right now. Uh, a lot of publishers and the middlemen are being cut out. So, so authors and content providers are going into, uh, like directly into publishing themselves digitally or in print even, and uh, you, can, you can create a lot of different, different content around material like this. So it's, it's really strengthening the brand. And it can be something really simple that will work in any channel. Like consider something like, uh, like this, one, one, just one panel like, like uh, cartoons and some funny caption contest or whatever, and that will work across regional newspapers to New Yorker magazine alike. So 
that's 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 something that that uh, where you can expand again and print um, how, do, how how does uh, like creating a, something like a cookbook again come back to like having engagement on mobile so for example uh, where this where the whole idea came from is is um, our our demographics uh, we don't we don't have like a, we, we do a lot of analytics and market studies but but we don't have like a exact figures of how many how many kids actually play the game on their parents devices for example but but from anecdotal evidence and from from all our studies that it's it's not a very uncommon case that um, people who own smartphones you have like the sweet spot at the at ages like 25 to 20 35 something like that and then these people have small kids uh, age maybe maybe three to six years old something like that and uh, they spend a lot of time together playing the game like kids play the game on their parents devices or even even like grandparents uh, play the game with their grandchildren so where, where do these families connect uh, we thought that it would be a fun idea that you know they can cook together maybe so provide something like this like activity book and create again like engagement for your audience like in the in the sort of same parameters as you as you have with the game and then of course on the fireworks side uh, we recently collaborated with with Finnair and uh, that's again like uh, how many how much uh, effort and are you going to put into like campaigns like this like one time one time campaign where you slap a sticker on a plane and uh, what's what's like the brand what's what's it uh, worth for your brand and uh, what will you gain from it uh, you can you can measure stuff like that again when you try to make it viral you can measure it in facebook likes and and page views and how much people are talking about it but then again like it doesn't always have to be that measurable we can safely say that this is this was a flight from helsinki to singapore and that must be like the most popular plane in singapore so why do we do this? Uh, uh, why do we why do we engage in that dialogue and why do we uh, promote through all channels? Is is of course about doing building a big business. Um, for example, if if we like making videos uh, to engage our fans on YouTube and and to have them share more 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 Angry Birds branded material, uh, we're also like building a channel. So it's it's uh, something where down the further down the line we can create more video content uh, like an animated series and we can have that content available for purchase somewhere uh, i don't know if we we're going to have any optical media in in uh, five ten years time but but you can probably buy angry birds angry birds uh, animations on dvd blu-ray sometime in the future so everything everything is is uh, it's it's while it's building engagement while it's building a reach you're also building a business but then again, at the same time, uh, the community is never about the money. It's always about the fans. And uh, for example, we had a really like heartbreaking bit of feedback the other week, where where um, this person was uh, was saying that uh, they had introduced their mother, who had been suffering from cancer, to Angry Birds, and it had been like the first time in years that their mother had actually been like like really genuinely laughing and having fun. And they said like that thanks again for providing such a great simple and fun way to simply laugh and and that's that's one thing that you really like you're always thinking about monetization thinking about engagement and and you you can it's so easy to move like further away from why did you de develop the game in the first place well to have like the most fun most engaging game in the world and uh, i think that's that's where we come from and that's why we made Angry Birds and that's why we try to keep preaching for it because we loved creating it and uh, seeing seeing like our fans love it love it alike and express their love for it that's like the best reward that's that's better than than any business and uh, that's that's uh, pretty much everything I had today and uh, we can do we still have time yeah yeah we can we can discuss engagement anything you have please Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. When you said that uh, it's great to release more updates, uh, what do you mean when you said updates? This is the update to the 
um, initial version, or you release these updates as a as a new titles actually? Oh, the updates that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, that was like the the one game. So uh, when Angry Birds was released, it had, had I, if I remember correctly, it had like 63 levels. Uh, now it has more. Nowadays it has more than and 250, and and all of this has been done in like 15 to 45 uh, level pack increments, and and it's free. It's not a not an enough purchase. So that's like we defined that our basic level of service uh, has to be that there's always something new coming for the fan, that you want to come back to the game to, because there's always going to be more content and more stuff for you. Yeah. That's up to you. <laughs> we decided uh, why we created, why we created Angry Birds Seasons. Uh, we figured that uh, you know we have a global audience. Not everybody in the world uh, celebrates Christmas, for example. So if we create a separate application that's just about fun, just about like different holidays, we don't we don't have to consider like, oh, well, of course we have to cult consider cultural sensibilities and so forth. But we create it for the fans. So if people love Angry Birds, they get more Angry Birds content. Be it Moon Festival, be it St. Patrick's Day, whatever. But but that was our reasoning that we have a, have like the core title that's just arbitrary. That's that's just going to be like fun Angry Birds themes. And then we have the seasons for the like true fans who who just want more content. Thanks. Uh, hi. hi. I, w I wanted to ask a question. Uh, if you're reaching for the biggest audience, like you said, you're yeah. trying to reach everywhere, why didn't you port your game into Facebook or some social networks, whatever? Uh, I, I think that we, like the focus was so much in the mobile at the first phase. So our, our strategy was to just to be big in mobile. and. Uh, we, we want it to be on every mobile platform, but since we have expanded it to just wanting to be on all screens everywhere. So we have, have something for in development for social networks, but we want to be, do it be, again. We want to polish it. We want it to be like the perfect, perfect social game and the best social game ever. So in mobile, uh, we did uh, aim early on to have the game available on as many platforms as possible. So then the social platform, I mean, we're only getting started in, in building the game for web, uh, building a game for, for consoles, for example, and then social platforms is logical continuation from that. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay, the success of the Angry Birds is incredible in the App Store, as I remember it. The uh, first, first run was in App Store, yeah? Yeah. Uh, there was many great games like Cut the Rope, Teeny Wings and others. Any suggestions for the newbies, uh, what is the best way to run the, our own game in App Store? That's, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, like I said about, the, like, you need, you need the visibility. And you know, you know App Store. When you open open it up, you have the featured titles. Uh, then you have the top charts, and then like anything that's like below uh, top 20, you're not gonna you're not basically gonna scroll there. So how do you get your game featured? For us, uh, I think I mentioned it briefly already. But for us, like uh, uh, we released the game through through a publisher. But we were just an in another independent developer at the time. So we released the game through Chilingo. Chilingo had like a steady, steady string from of top 10 titles on, in the App Store at the time. So it made sense to go with that. Okay, so uh, that got us some visibility, but uh, Angry Birds didn't like take off just overnight. So we were really pushing for this grassroots grassroots buzz in the local markets. And you know, we, we were just uh, going by word of mouth in Finland phoned up all our friends and said that we have a new game out and then then we were number one in Finland and then we went to Sweden and said that look at this game it's number one in Finland that it's really nice and then we were number one in Sweden and then Denmark and Greece and Germany and wherever so 
uh, about the time in in February uh, 2010. It, it's it had been like three good good uh, two two and a half months from from the initial release of the game. We had about five seven uh, number one ranks in Europe. And then we went to, we, we still like pushed it to Apple, like look at this game, that it's getting some traction and, and it's been successful in a number of countries. And then it was featured in the UK App Store, and then the UK was a bigger market compared to other European countries. And then started to sell in the UK, went number one there because it was featured, and then it went number one in the US, and then, but then, like all of this, like how we provide the service, what we do around the game, that has all added up into the stickiness. So, of course, like there's a lot of games that go the number one, but they also sink down. So you have to consider like how do you keep it there? Like how do you provide the service? How do you keep people coming back to it? How do you keep people talking about it? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, when you told like uh, the fact when your game became popular in Finland after talking to your friends, um, I remember the famous Russian joke, I think, when a guy is asked how did he become a millionaire, he said, I would wash 10 apples and sell them clean for extra, and the next day 20 apples, and the third day my uncle died and left me 10 million. But <coughs> <laughs> what I wanted to ask you um, is, Obviously, you guys are great in building up the business and you are great in packaging such an awesome product as Angry Birds. Uh, what is your feeling? Uh, uh, do you think that Rovio also has now an insight to what a second Angry Birds can be? Do you, do you feel any confidence that you can build a brand that's similar to it? Or is your strategy to just tie in other brands with Angry Birds and we see like Batman and Angry Birds and, and so forth? And so I, it's just a question because I do see it as a perfect black swan and a very highly improbable event that changes the course of the business. So I, I do not, personally, I don't believe that black swan is repeatable per se, but um, I, I just wanted to understand what is your opinion, uh, how well do you feel your audience? Uh, do you feel that these kids, grandmas, and millions and millions of people are there and will be there for a second game or a second title of Rovio, which is not Angry Birds. And um, uh, so that's it. The, the commitment, the, uh, uh, how, uh, how is it, um, I would say, uh, independent from the main brand and uh, what, how Rovio feels about it. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for your question. Uh, I, I think that um, there's, a, there's a lot of room like under, uh, uh, for us as a company like as, a, as an entertainment company, there's a lot of room for like parallel brands. So with Angry Birds, I, I don't think we'd like want to create something to top Angry Birds. We want to keep on expanding and building Angry Birds. And of course, like in mobile, uh, mobile games are successful now because people have less and less, like people have precious little time. So they can engage with your game, your apps for 30 seconds at a time or two minutes or, or then two hours if they have more. But like, how do we like we we start to cannibalize our own if we're if we're keeping people engaged in mobile on some brand and then then we make we can't build as successful brands as that of course because we, we, people people will start spending their time with those then your other brands will will become irrelevant irrelevant but i i think that that we can we know the angry birds audience and we have a really good feel like what, what are their expectations and wants and needs and what, what, what do we bring more under the Angry Birds brand and that umbrella. But then we also, also we're building other, other properties as well. And um, I think the, uh, like, uh, like it's not going to be badged as, as something with Angry Birds. But of course like now we have the reach and the audience, we can bring out more games like from the makers of Angry Birds. And, and that's probably going to be interesting. It's not going to be all targeted to the same overall audience. Now we, can, now we can have like smaller titles sitting next to Angry Birds. I don't, I don't know if this satisfies your <laughs> question, but <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, so you said you released uh, the game via the publisher's channels, right? So, and uh, so now that Angry Birds is kind of big, uh, what's your relation to that publisher and uh, IP rights and all the policies that you have? Uh, so uh, we released it on, on, with a publisher in, uh, on iOS. And, uh, and then when we, we had success on iOS, we had the opportunity to self-publish on Android, for example. 
And then the subsequent titles, we, we only had a, had a publishing deal with the, with the one title, not the property. So with Angry Birds Seasons, uh, Angry Birds Rio, then they're, they're, they're different stories and, and they have been published, published by, uh, by Rovio. So um, now, we, now we've, we've, uh, we also have the opportunity as a, as a successful self-publisher to look at other independent developers and publishing their, their titles as well. Извините, я плохо говорю по-английски. У меня э, такой вопрос. Вот у вас висит прекрасная игрушка на шее. И я хотела бы спросить, вы не пытались популяризировать вашу игру именно с помощью детских игрушек, киндер-сюрпризов, брелоков каких-то, каких-то вот, вот таких визуальных вещей, которые можно взять руку, попробовать, пощупать? И не боитесь ли вы, что какие-то другие компании перехватят ваш бренд? Okay, so the question was that are we are we afraid? Have we made like a brand collaborations and uh, and uh, are we afraid that other people will will capitalize on our brand? Um, I think that we what we're looking at in our collaborations, like with in the Angry Birds Rio tie-in, and then like any products that we're doing, we're we're looking at whether it makes sense, like. Is there really sense in like having Angry Birds everything on shelves at the stores? Uh, probably not. But wherever like we can have like a quality product and a quality brand match, uh, if it makes sense for our fans as well, then that's good for good enough for us. Uh, then uh, we at the moment, I think that we're one of the most pirated brands in China, for example. So there's a lot of uh, uh, just illegal, unlicensed merchandise around. Uh, that's that's then something that we we have to like tackle tackle to through our legal departments and so on. But but uh, in I don't think that at the moment we're we're like selling ourselves short. We're we're trying to build like quality collaborations for long lasting lasting collaboration. So I think that's all the time we have. Okay, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you, Vilja.